Reflecting on Cork's All-Ireland triumph in the week after their win against Down, this was the moment Conor Coonan said he wished he could have frozen to relive over and over again. At the final whistle, a wave of unbridled joy and uncontrollable relief swept around the Rebels' management, players and fans at Croke Park and further afield. The bitter disappointment of four consecutive All-Ireland final defeats was forgotten. There were many days, you know, when it looked as if these lads would never get their medal, but look, fortunately enough, um, the, the men above was looking down on us and we got over the line this time. The team had overcome controversy and adversity. It's yeah. not a term I was uh, familiar with in a GA no, no, no. context. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, fish hook. The fish hook, yeah, yeah, of course. It's, it's the move of 2010. Cork had bridged a 20-year gap to win back Sam Maguire. I'm dreamy of over the last couple of years. He could, he could you actually get there, and I suppose, in the whistle win. It was a, a realisation that you had, you had finally got over the line. This is the story of Cork's championship success. This is how Cork's footballers ended 20 years of hurt. Two thousand and nine had ended in heartbreak for the Cork senior footballers, having played some of the best football of the year and defeated one of the favourites, Tyrone, in the semi-final. They came unstuck against their nearest neighbours and fiercest rivals, Kerry, in the final. That wasn't the first time Cork had tasted defeat in the final in recent years. Four times they'd been as far as the last day of the championship since they last won Sam Maguire back in 1990. There's no doubt that Mayo are the, the heartbreak story of Gaelic football. They've lost so many All-Irelands since their last one in 1951. But by the same token, Cork have had their fair share of heartbreak since 1990. Finals 93, 99, 2007, 2009. We've probably been in about six All-Irelands uh, between the period of 87 and 93, if you included the, the replay against me. And, um, you know, the idea that having won the back-to-backs then, you know, to say that we'd be 20 years down the road, it just goes to show just, you know, how funny sport can be. I suppose the point that losing for all Ireland finals between 1990 and this year, you know, was uh, always going to be a major talking point for everybody in the country. But you have to take into account, you know, when you look at the teams that beat them in, in, in recent years, you know, Kerry were there, you know, with the, the monkey in their back, I suppose, and they just couldn't shake it off. And um, I think we were all expecting going into this year's uh, all Ireland Championship that it was going to be much of the same. It can become psychological, and as a former player, a team can sort of get in on you, and you find it hard to work out how you're ever going to beat them, and uh, one of them, the, the players have the battle really inside when push comes to shove later on in matches. There was a lot of pressure on guys at the time, which in all is we probably tried to minimise that as best we could, but... You know, um, there were many days, you know, when it looked as if these lads would never get their medal. Having been beaten by Kerry in the 2009 All-Ireland Final, Cork faced the Kingdom once again in the 2010 Munster Semi-Final. Cork came into the game as league champions. Last September, these age-old rivals collided for the second time in three years in the All-Ireland Final, and Kerry once again came out on top. The question today is, can Cork set the record straight as Munster's big two go head to head. The first day uh, Cork played Kerry in the, the Munster uh, Championship, it looked like they were going to win. They were well on top. They won everything in midfield. Aidan Walsh, though his kicking wasn't particularly good, he was fantastic in his championship debut in the middle of the field. And uh, they were well, well in control of this game. They dominated in that first 20, 25 minutes. I mean, particularly in the halfback line and the midfield. Um, Kerry were all at sea. Cork were the dominant team. Both of us were. We're coming in and we're, you know, we're finding our feet. You know, we were trying to get out a couple of cobwebs as well out of the system because we hadn't, uh, we hadn't a game before we met Kerry, so it's very hard to mimic championship. But when it comes in, you, you still have the ferocity of it. But um, we, we, we start, we started well, but you know, Kerry started a bit sluggish, but they came back into the game. Then. Uh, a problem began to manifest, manifest itself during the National League and that was Cork were on top of teams but they weren't closing the door out fully. They were leaving the door open a little bit. It happened during the National League against teams like Monaghan when they came back at them, Tyrone and Galway. 
the, this problem um, it became it came to the surface again during the championship when we saw it in that first game against Kerry. Cork played all the football, but they left the door open a little bit. You know, you're, you're probably not going to take all the chances that you're going to create in the game, but you know, Kerry finished very strong in it. Um, you know, they, they created a lot of chances the last 20 minutes and they took an awful lot of them and you know, we, were, we were really hanging on towards them. The turning point came in, 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 the, in the second half really when Paul Gavin came on for Kerry. Uh, Cork had been dominant in the half-back line, hoovering up a lot of breaking ball um, and in the middle of the park. And when Paul Gavin came on, I think Cork had won seven kickouts in a row previous um, to Paul coming onto the pitch. Kerry won the next six. The drawing game and the replay against Kerry was really, you know, it encapsulated Galvin, really, didn't it? Um, I think the, the first day he was just so good. He was mesmerisingly good. Made such a huge difference to Kerry. Pulled it, pulled it out of the fire for them, really, in the drawing game. It, it was an unbelievable performance in just 20 minutes. He was nearly man of the match. Kerry came back, earned themselves a draw, and again, the questions were asked, would Cork ever beat Kerry in a really big game? We, we kind of felt that... You know, we, you know, you played Kerry and you, you didn't lose the game, you you drawn and it was a championship game when we had a good quality game under our belt, so you were, you were kind of just you know, trying to put that in the bank and store that and look forward to the, the game in, in a week's time. In the replay uh, against Kerry, Cork looked like they, they, they were going to win it again, but again they, they conceded a, a late score to, to, to level it up. Mark O'Shea was the man who put it over the bar and it just shows you what a good footballer he is. Mark does his usual burst up the pitch and you know he, he rarely misses something when he and he actually has the shot himself. A lot of the time he, he might burst up, burst up the pitch and lay it off the forward in a better position, but he burst up the pitch and kept going and he, he was in the best position at the end of it and he kicked a good score. I think after the 70 minutes we felt like you know we, we had it and we, we left it slipping because it was always going to be hard for us an extra time. With Graham Canty having been sent off, Cork did indeed find it hard an extra time and were out of the Munster Championship. You know, I, my, my opinion varied that day from Pat McAnini, but um, you know, these things happen. Like, you know, I wasn't going to dwell in it. You know, I don't think I dwelled in it all year. And these things happen. You know, it's, it happens in a split second. The referee and the umpires, they have, um, they have a split second to make a decision. And um, you know, I, I thought they got it wrong that day, but um, we move on from it. Kerry's Paul Galvin is facing a possible eight-week ban. The GAA Central Competitions Control closed the ban following this incident late in Kerry's monster semi-final win against Cork on Sunday. And then obviously in the replay there was uh, the, the fish hook incident with, uh, with Owen Cadigan, which was obviously... You it's know, not a term I was uh, familiar with in the GAA no, 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 context of yeah, this one. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, the fish hook, yeah, of course, it's, it's the move of 2010 now. When it happened in real time, I, I didn't see it to be honest with you, but when I saw it afterwards, you know, I, I think Paul even admitted himself, you know, he shouldn't have done it. What I did was, was you know, you, I, you, you couldn't condone and I didn't, you know, I was, I was, I, I was wrong to do what I did and I, I felt it best to take it on the chin, you know. I certainly have views on it, but, you know, I think an awful lot has driven now in terms of the media. I mean, it's fairly clear to me in terms of what happened and what occurred, but, you know, I think the fact that we go publicly on newspapers and media, you know, I think their rules and regulations there, let, let them be enforced and, you know, I think that's best where that's left. You can't condone that sort of action no matter what you do, like sticking, it, sticking your finger into a fella's mouth and pulling out his teeth or his tongue or whatever, but, you know, we have to look at the history of all this again and, and I think Owen Callaghan was probably in Paul Gavin's black book that we, we heard about before and Jack O'Connor's uh, autobiography referred to Gavin, if you annoy him he, he puts names in the book and he'll go at you again, so there's a little bit of history there, the fact that the two of them are sent off during the National League. The main cause of controversy over that in Kerry was the fact that Derek Kavanagh wasn't punished. The, the Central Competitions Control Committee in Club Park looked at the Paul Galvin uh, incident on video and decided he needed to be punished, but they chose not to even review the Derek Kavanagh incident. It was go for the goose, it's go for the gander, as I said, you know, and I, I think, you know, he got away with it and that, you know, that really made Kerry people very, very unhappy in terms of the way uh, you see Paul Galvin being treated and Derek Kavanagh get away with an incident that you know, something similar happened off the ball and should have been dealt with by the CCCC. Despite having had the advantage of playing at home here at Porky Cueve, Cork were out of the Munster Championship. After the break, we'll see how they fought back through the qualifiers. Provided we got a reasonable draw in the, uh, the qualifiers, then, you know, it probably could be of benefit to us.
The new Garda mobile safety camera vans are on roads where people have died. See the locations at Garda.ie. Black Excess for Her. Fragrances by Paco Rabanne. The new KFC Popcorn Variety Bucket. With heaps of golden popcorn chicken for the kids and original recipe chicken, fries and dips for the rest of the family. With ice and a slice of lime, experience an intriguing of Tia Maria and cranberry juice. Get behind the mask. Discover more with Tia Maria. Remember Derek? Who? Derek, the guy who took him to the Debs. He totally just blanked me. I know what you're thinking, he blanked me. I was the one that was getting all handsy on the dance floor, like, you know? This actually isn't a great time. It's fine, I'm a meet here. Sinead, I have to And then go. he blanks me like I'm the freak. I should be the one doing the blanking. <laughs> Do you remember? He didn't even get me chocolates. Remember that tin of biscuits? I know. Sinead. Sinead. Are you following him? Yeah. Call the U.S. for an incredible 15 cent a minute with Meteor. Looking to plan your future? Don't miss Choices 2011, January 21st to the 24th at the Aviva Stadium, Dublin. Ireland's largest education, careers and work and study abroad expo. Pre-register at choices2011.com. Sponsored by TV3, FM 104 and go to college.ie. Listen, you can hear it. The revolution. Every minute of every day, someone new seizes power. The power to remove twice as much plaque as a manual brush. The power to get a dentist clean feeling every day. Seize power today. And from now until Christmas, Oral-B rechargeable toothbrushes can be found at half price. This year... Discover a magical world where adventure comes in all sizes. <laughs> Gulliver's Travels. Douglas Court has everything you need this Christmas with over 100 stores in Douglas Court and Douglas Village shopping centres. Home to top fashion boutiques, hairdressers, gift shops, as well as Dunn stores, the largest Tesco and Munster, the newest Marks and Spencers, a great choice of cafes and lots of free parking. For a few million euro, I'd introduce my fiancé PJ to a swimwear model who loves hurling and redheads. Why do anything to become a millionaire when you can just play lotto? Play early. Our weekend lotto draw is on Christmas Eve and we've added one million euro to the jackpot. Happy Christmas from the National Lottery. Zips Krenatina fire logs are the only fire logs made in Ireland. What's more, they're 100% natural. They're easy to light and burn for over two hours. So relax and love your fire with Zip. to a great story. The new Canon PowerShot SX210IS with 14 times optical zoom and dynamic optical image stabilizer. There is amazing, super easy savings this Christmas at Juris Bar. Hardy's Bin Wines, only $6.99 each. And Galbert's Party Food Range, buy one, get one free. McVitie's Victoria Biscuits, only $6.99. Super easy savings at Juris Bar, the super easy supermarket. In 2010, Cork finally bridged a 20-year gap to win back Sam Maguire. However, they didn't get off to a good start, losing to Kerry after a replay in the Munster semi-final. That meant Conor Coonan's side would have to plot a route through the qualifiers. 
qualifiers are sort of a killer cure for, for teams. They go into it, if you get the right draw, you go in with the right attitude, you can resurrect your season. Kildare did it this year, Tipperary did it in the hurling. Other counties just can't seem to get it together. Ah, sure, listen, I suppose it certainly there's a certain amount of disappointment, but, you know, as I said at the outset, you know, we were very much geared this year towards winning the All-Ireland, and, you know, being beaten by Kelly by a very narrow margin, you know, said to us, look, you're still well there, you're still in, in the hunting pack. You know, from our point of view, we were learning a bit more about our players and, you know, uh, provided we got a reasonable draw in the uh, the qualifiers, then, you know, it probably could be of benefit to us. We lost to Kerry after replay an extra time. You know, it's, it's not the end of the world. It wasn't the end of our season. Kerry are a very good side and one of, one of the best sides over the last 10 years. So we lost them narrowly and um, we, we learned a couple of things out of that game as well. It was still early in the year and, uh, you know, I suppose we just... We just parked at that stage and moved on to the All Ireland series, and you know I think from from there on in as well, you every game you played it was it was knockout, and you know that that brought its own pressures, and um, I think that the pressures probably suited us. I think it's important that players recover quite quickly from the fact that they've been beaten in their provincial championships, but that they're still in the All Ireland series, and I think a lot of teams haven't come around to that fact. Um, now Cork, I suppose, can take a lot of solace in the fact that other teams have gone through the back door, particularly our Tyrone's and Kerry, Kerry had done it. Um, so from their point of view, they hadn't performed well in the back door, but this was a real opportunity for them. Plus the fact they had a stronger panel. I think it gave Conor Coonan a chance to give players a lot of game time. Um, he had used 30 players in the National League, so and he blooded the likes of Kieran Shane, Jamie O'Sullivan in, in around the full back area, Aidan Walsh uh, um, in, in the middle of the park as well. So he had good players blooded, but it was just a blend that he needed. And I think the qualifiers uh, gave Cork that opportunity to actually go into it, gain a little bit of momentum, get a couple of hard games under, under their belt, and when it came to the all Ireland semi-final and all Ireland final, that the players he had on the pitch would have been tested. Cork had a really comfortable in the qualifier against Cavan, uh, which is what they needed, get the confidence back up, um, and that's all that was really going to happen from that game, but it seemed to be ideal for them. I know Tommy Carr, the Cavan manager, was hugely impressed with, as everyone is, with both their size and also their professionalism probably isn't the right word but their preparation the way Cork seemed to arrive at grounds and I think maybe intimidate teams like Cavan a team a team like that without many big name players who maybe haven't played on the biggest of stages they're playing against a team like Cork the Cork lads file out they're all doing these uh, hugely intense warm-ups they're all looking big and strong they're all fast I would reckon a lot of teams particularly in the qualifiers might be almost beaten by Cork in the way the teams are sometimes beaten by Kerry and Toronto before they come out the first game against Cavan, that was a total mismatch and it screamed at that from the page initially from the, from when the draw was made. Cavan were, I suppose, I suppose buoyed by a strong performance the week before. They'd knocked out Wicklow and they were seven points down. But Tommy Carr himself admitted it, you know, even before he went down to Cork, that they, they were going to be up against it again, against Cork in Parky Cueve. I suppose, as you said, you know, that they'd come on the back of a very good win over Wicklow two weeks previous to the game, which I was actually at. And I suppose, you know, I think it was with 20 minutes ago, they were eight points up and um, Wicklow had 15 against 13. I mean, in many, uh, in my eyes, it certainly was nearly the performance of the championship in terms of turning that around. And uh, I would have felt that, you know, we would have got a much better challenge from them in Cork. But I suppose, fortunately enough, from our point of view, we probably got in top and early, got a few scores. And as you said, you know, the home advantage is, is a big plus in, in the qualifiers. Me down to Cork, I suppose, with, with um, absolutely nothing to lose, and we'd, we'd, we'd everything to lose. You know, if we won the game by six or seven points, there's kind of a case that all oh, Cork should be should be winning by that, and if if not a bit more, and it was closer than, or you know, if Kevin snuck a win out of it, you know, we were we were going to be down the dumps. But um, you know, we were, we were focused going into it. I think you know we were we were out of the provincial series, so it was, it was a knockout game, and. You know, it's very easy to focus yourself if it's a, if it's a knockout championship game. Anyone from Cavan will tell you it's one of the poorest performances they've seen from their team in a long time. It was played out in an almost surreal atmosphere. There's only a couple of thousand people there as, as the Cork uh, fans just didn't get behind the team. The crowd there was absolutely pitiful. What was it, two and a half thousand, three thousand people, I think, in Porky Grieve that day. I mean, it was not the sort of occasion where you know, an unknown Cavan wing back is going to say, this is the day I'm going to burst onto the national scene. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, the whole story for that, the whole story for that game was written beforehand, and Cavan played out their part in the script pretty dutifully, I think. Cork rolled on into the next round. They had Wexford in Wexford Park, slightly tougher opposition playing away. 
again, they would have been expected to win, and they did. Wexford didn't really think they had much of a chance against Cork, and Cork knew that, played on the, the insecurities of, of Wexford. Wexford had beaten Galway, though, so you would have thought that they might have a decent chance. No? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the form line isn't too kind to my own home county here, Owen. Uh, Not because, quite the powerhouse of football well, anymore, they like to think. Well, I was actually at the Galway-Wexford game, and it would rank among the more depressing evenings or afternoons of my life. Wexford certainly under Jason Ryan over the last number of years have made significant progress, and as you said, they came off the back of a, a good win of Oven Pier Stadium. We were going down there on that particular day. We knew it was going to be a tough battle. Um, I suppose conditions were horrific. It was real winter weather, and. Um, we started reasonably well, got on top, got a few scores, but before half time, I think Wexford narrowed the gap a bit. But, you know, I think at half time, with a few words with the lads and, you know, needed to up the game a bit. Luckily enough, after half time, we came out and we got a couple of early scores and it kind of settled us for the rest of the end. And for me, it was a bit of a turning point because Wexford were a tough team to beat in the conditions and everything else, and that was a really strong performance. Plus, for the first time, we're seeing the strength and depth. The players that he brings on, he brought on Cardigan, he brought on O'Leary, he brought on Murphy, and they were the boys that pushed him over the finishing line. And for the first time, that strength and depth uh, became a key factor. Limerick and Fairness are another story in Munster this year that you overlook them now, and they're another footnote to the Cork season and even the Kerry Munster season. But they had their chances. They're a county that surely you would imagine is going to make a breakthrough at some stage, and they really put Cork to the pin of their collar. Uh, that's the kind of game, though, that I think ultimately stood Cork in pretty good stead. Limerick were, were coming into this game buoyed by strong performance again against Kerry. They were 114 to 10 points down and they got it back level 114 to 114 and Kerry just saw out the game by a couple of points later on. They had three or four weeks of a break. Limerick had uh, Tony Buckley um, the coach of the uh, coach of Limerick was making noises that he had chances chances to actually beat Cork in, in, in the qualifiers this year. Played well, very much in control and then you know we conceded uh, a soft penalty, gave away a soft point. The next thing we knew we were going into extra time. Cork looked to be heading for a comfortable win, but now they're under pressure again. That's a poor kick out from Alan Quirk and Limerick are back on the attack. Conor Fitzgerald has the ball. Conor Fitzgerald, the substitute, has kicked the equaliser and it looks like we'll have extra time here at the Gaelic grounds. You know, it was a fairly daunting atmosphere. I remember the crowd, you know, the Limerick crowd really getting behind their team just at the start of, of extra time. And, you know, I remember saying to the lads in the rest of them, you know, we have a tough battle here, but Nevertheless, you know, we kept emphasising the fact that we had controlled the game for the bulk of it and, you know, if we could get back to grips, then it was well within our grasp. You know, I think the management, managing the user bench as we were doing all year again, and, you know, the, the bit of fresh legs at the end, um, especially in extra time, we, we, were, we, had, we had legs that we were able to bring on, you know, that, that really stood to us, you know, we had legs that were maybe able to carry the ball across the midfield when it was required, we got a couple of points early and, when you were able to carry the ball, didn't maybe take the sting out of the Limerick challenge. We, we, we had lads that had, that had um, you know, enough rest in the bench to start the game to be able to do that, and you know, it stood to us at the end. You know, some people might describe it as winning dirty, and, and, and that's the type of thing we have had to do on numerous occasions during the year, um, albeit some of it our own fault. But you know, it takes a certain amount of character to do that, and you know, maybe in, in previous years maybe we didn't show that type of metal, but you know, it was very positive now that we were able to grind out those results. It bounced back from the Munster Championship defeat by Kerry with three wins in the qualifiers, but still questions were being raised about their form. After the break, we'll take a look at their performance in the All-Ireland quarterfinal against Roscommon. For them to win the quarter final was their All-Ireland final, and anything after that was bonus territory.
get your hands on a great Blackwater Press bestseller like Lisa Fitzpatrick enjoying style and fashion. The ultimate beauty and fashion book. Look your best by Tara King. Lorraine Keane's Tell All Working the Red Carpet and Cook Up an Italian Storm with Paolo Tullio Cooks Italian. All available in Eason's, Hughes and Hughes and bookshops nationwide. VIP, the new feminine fragrance, Carolina Herrera. Don't miss the Paris City St. Stephen's Day sale from 9 o'clock this Sunday. Every TV is on sale and there's great deals on the latest laptops. That's the sale of the year at Paris City St. Stephen's Day. It's the celebration of the century. Disney on Ice, 100 years of magic. 18 classic stories, 24 unforgettable songs, and more than 60 of your favourite Disney characters in one spectacular ice show. Disney on Ice. Tickets on sale now. Josh Groban. Illuminations. Includes his own amazing version of Galileo. Who puts the rainbow in the sky? Josh Groban and his stunning new album, Illuminations. Also includes the single, Hidden Away. Hidden Away. Josh Groban, Illuminations. Out now at Tesco. Bon Jovi. Extra date added due to demand. June 30th, the RDS Dublin. Tickets are on sale now. Dublin's new Radio Nova. 100 FM. Seriously addictive music. Ooh, my throat! If your sore throat needs warming comfort, try this. New Strepsils Warm Lozenges with medicinal action and a unique warming sensation. <sighs> so you feel like this. Wrap up with new Strepsils Warm. Three wins as they made their way through the qualifiers. Questions were still being asked about Cork's form. Could they realistically challenge for an All-Ireland title without improving? Ross Common in the All-Ireland quarterfinal provided their next obstacle. Tony Shine steps up to the plate and drills it over the bar. Ten points in a Connacht final. It's all over. Would you believe it? The 4-1 to one outsiders have torn up the form book yet again. And Roscommon are Connacht champions for the first time in nine long, hard years. good news story the championship obviously um, we, we, there was a lot of bad stuff went on in terms of goals there weren't goals and square balls but from the point of view of, of a great story was coming coming through and winning the Connacht Championship at a time when nobody gave them a prayer they played London in the early rounds of the Championship and people were well London themselves were making noises that they could actually be was coming this year um, and to go on and actually win that Connacht title uh, which was, that proved what a phenomenal year it was for them. They had a little bit of extra help, I'd say, in, in the late race, Dermot Early, who would have been smiling down them from heaven. He was involved in a lot of the, the underage development of the likes of uh, Donny Shine and Carl Craig and these guys when they played underage football. So for them to win the Connacht final was their all in final. They had very little pressure on them. I mean, all the pressure was on us, despite, you know, probably criticisms or performance people would have considered us as uh, very hot favourites for that game. And that's never easy. It's, it's difficult. It's difficult to motivate a team like that, whereas, yeah, I'm sure from Fergus' point of view, you know, he didn't have any problem motivating his team. And, you know, to be fair to him, Roscommon have made tremendous strides in, in the last year under Fergal and that. And, um, you know, they really put it up to us. Five or ten minutes into the second half, it was, was anyone's game. When we, we lucky enough, we, we pushed on. Pierce got a good goal and we 
we managed to finish strong in the game. There was a five minute period in the second half where Cork were, were really up against it. Ross Common had gone a point ahead and you know we couldn't really see any out for Cork but we saw a little bit of strength and depth and we had players on the bench that he brought on. Alan O'Connor team came on that day and played well. Um, and the, you know they literally scored one nine to two points in that last 20 minutes and it was enough to see them into the into the all semi final. So they showed their strength and depth. We probably showed a bit of composure and we probably relied on a small bit of experience. We kind of we kind of said to ourselves that you know we we played more on Cork Park than last comment had over the last couple of years and we were hoping that that would that would shine through and you know look and panic a whole lot. Um, we went a point behind, but there was still an awful lot of time left. You know, Cork Park is a huge pitch, and you know, 20, 25 minutes of it, there's an awful lot of running left, and there's an awful lot of ball to be played. And you know, luckily enough, on the day we managed to get a couple of scores there, and then you know, with, with Pierce's goal, then I think that was the that was the final nail in the coffin, maybe for us coming up there. They could have uh, won by more, but Donegal O'Connor chose to put a late uh, penalty over the bar, which in retrospect might have been a, a good decision because. They got a penalty against Dublin uh, in the All-Ireland semi-final and uh, Stephen Cluxon, the Dublin keeper, didn't know which way perhaps that, that uh, Dunica O'Connor was going to put the ball because the, the previous penalty popped it over the bar. I think Graham Canty as well was another feature of that game, uh, the Graham Canty injury, mm. uh, which is something that hampered, Go uh, ham hampered Cork later on, especially in the final. I mean, Canty, similar to Shefflin in the hurling, is a guy who probably could have done it resting Mm. Once he had his injury for the entire year, it's like, it was a hamstring, it was something that was liable to go again. Should have probably stayed at home and stayed at home, alright. Or I'm more comfortable at home, the backs, but uh, yeah, I went up to try and help the lads above. But um, yeah, I hurt my hamstring that day and I was in a bit of trouble if I come off straight away with it. And you know, even you know, that, that night or that, the couple of days afterwards, you know, especially that you were, uh, you were in a small bit of trouble with it. And you know, it was going to be at least a couple of weeks, three or four weeks with it. and. Um, you know you'd be battling against time, but um, you know you were just kind of taking it one day at a time and trying to do what you could every day and see how it was going to react to it. We probably had three or four weeks, so typically hamstrings, you know, if you're lucky enough, they're, they're a three week, but you, you never really know. Um, and you know, I suppose we can't get too bogged down into individual players. You know, um, if some guy is going to be out or going to be lost, we just have to move on. And you know, we're fortunate enough to have strength and depth and um, you know have good replacements so um, so we just just move on if, if something goes wrong you you move to the next step Cork were now just one step away from the All-Ireland final and with Down having beaten Kerry in the last eight it meant the Rebels wouldn't have to beat the Kingdom if they were to go on and win Sam Maguire however they would have to beat an improving Dublin just one man to aim at he's found Bray he's inside Cullen can he get his second goal Dublin are judged by very harsh standards. It's interesting, they actually only played three really bad games this year against Galway in the National League, uh, against Wexford, which they won in the Championship, and against me. Uh, but when things go wrong for Dublin, it's, 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 a, it's a national disaster almost. Against Wexford, they were very poor. Their game plan, their defensive game plan didn't work. They reverted to their more attacking type. They, they managed to win it after extra time. There's no, there's no denying that the, the Mead game was a disaster, but Mead hadn't beat them in nearly 10 years, so they were, they were due one over the Dubs. Uh, they scored five goals, maybe a few of them could have been disallowed uh, in the build-up. Um, it was a real learning curve for Dublin because uh, after that they, they came out in the qualifiers, they, they tightened things up, they kept the defence really tight and they played really, really well. They came into the Tyrone game in the All-Ireland quarterfinals without much expectation on their shoulder. You know, since they got knocked out in Leinster, they, they showed great form and you know, I think they, they found the style of play that, suit, that suited them and su suited the bunch of players they had. Um, <coughs> You know, they're a very strong, very physical team. Uh, they knew what they were about, they defended very well. And um, in Bernard Brogan, if you could get quality ball into him, you know, this, he's very hard to stop. And he, he, you know, he proved it nearly all last year, that he was nearly unmarkable if you can get quality ball into him. Certainly in terms of progress, they were probably the team that showed most progress during the course of the year. And I suppose that's a compliment to their management in that. This is a classic example of the back door suit in the team. And uh, Dublin were one of those teams this year. Um, they adopted a, they adopted a tactic which we'd never seen in Dublin uh, football before, where it was about um, conceding less rather than scoring more than the opposition. It was defend on mass and attack with pace and purpose. And you know, in the early rounds of the championship, it didn't suit them. They were still finding their feet in Crow Park on a bigger pitch. But once you got into the latter rounds of the qualifiers, particularly against Armagh and against Tyrone, when that owner guard a goal with minutes left in the game saw them over the finishing line, we, we saw that they were beginning to believe in this ta this tactic that Gilroy had moulded a team. He, he was vindicated in terms of leaving a lot of the lads that were beaten the year before um, by Kerry by 17 points. Uh, he was vindicated.
indicate in terms of leaving those lads on the line and now Dublin had all the momentum going into this game they had confidence and added into that was the fact that they had one of the best forwards in the country and that was Bernard Brogan who was scoring all around him from, from, from my point of view I thought he would have stuck Michael, Michael Sheehan's Conor Coonan would have stuck Michael Sheehan's on Bernard Brogan early on I thought it was a dodgy enough decision to stick Ray Curdy on him because um, Bernard Brogan was physically a bigger player than him and that was proven in, in, in the first 15 minutes but I suppose that early goal you know um, the ball over the top and Curdy was caught flat footed in front and it landed in, in, into Bernard's bread basket and stuck it into the back of the net probably for the goal of the championship that set, set Dublin, uh, Dublin up for the best there we have We'd like to feel now at this stage that we'd have a certain level of experience at that level and you know I think that's very important and you know, if, if we could get on top of Dublin early, then we might uh, create a few doubts in them. But, you know, they got the goal, really lifted them. And as you said, they had tremendous following, tremendous atmosphere, and they grew from strength to strength from that. And as Dublin went from strength to strength, Cork's cause wasn't helped by the loss of a clearly struggling Graham Canty to injury. You were laid up and you were injured, and you kind of, you know that, you know, there's a very good squad there and any of the lads that were, that were on the pitch, they were doing their best and a couple of lads that came on, you know, they had a huge impact, you know, Nicholas and Colum O'Neill of course in particular, you know, Colum had no standing, you know, 15 minutes towards the end of the game. When we look at Cork's performance, um, you know, the, the, there was a lot of lateral, ponderous hand passing across the half-back line. Um, and they weren't getting the ball inside to their, to their key forwards and that slow build-up suited Dublin's play. As the game wore on, Maybe they just tired a little bit, maybe a little bit of an experience because they've got quite a lot of young players and a lot of players who've never actually won a match at that stage before. They started conceding frees, they, they started conceding penalties. Ross McConnell got sent off and it all fell apart from there and Cork just about squeezed over the line. Once Dunnick has stuck the penalty, you would have said the momentum was with us, but Dublin responded and, and, and full credit uh, to them. But, you know, again, we dug deep and, uh, you know, got, got a few breaks on the day, which is, is important at this level because the margins are so tight, you do need the breaks. And um, with that bit of composure, we, we got over the line. It, it was a, a crazy day in Crow Park. The red and the blue reminded me very much of the, the Heineken Cup final between Munster and Leinster, actually. The semi-final, yeah. The semi-final, yeah. And it was, it was just a, it was a, an amazing occasion. The football was, was good without being great. And again, Cork were struggling a little bit, but it, there, it was still a million of miles away from the depths of the Limerick game or the Wexford game. I mean, I think that display by Cork against Dublin in the All-Ireland semi-final was, was worthy of All-Ireland champions and particularly the last 10 minutes was very much worthy of a team that you would say, right, these, these guys are good enough to go on and win All-Ireland and they'll deserve it because in a situation like that, you have to get it done. No matter how it gets done, you have to get the job done and yeah. Dunnock O'Connor showed ice in his veins to hit those frees in the last couple of minutes and, and also to, to slot the penalty. It was, there, there were turns throughout that game in ways but when Cork had to be ahead, they got ahead, and it was it was a, an occasion to be savoured for a lot of Cork fans, I know. Um, and also the the finishing at the end was just was top class. Yeah, I'll have to put my Dublin hat on though. Here, I didn't actually physically bring my John yeah. McNally <laughs> late eighties Dublin hat, but um, they are kicking themselves to this day. I think mm. the players that they didn't win that match. Now sport is littered with. Uh, teams that have lost who feel like that they shouldn't have lost and they don't blame anyone else mm. bar themselves even Bernard Brogan who was immaculate almost that day he was brilliant again kicked a load of points as he had throughout he was wasteful in possession towards mm. the end went for one glory shot that really was the wrong option yeah. and the best teams probably don't take those options if they're up against if Kerry up against a, uh, sorry if Cork were up against a Tyrone type team in that same situation you'd imagine they might have been squeezed out because there were doubts in the Cork mind it, this was an epic all Ireland semi final and I don't think anybody wanted to end so even though Cork won when the final whistle went there was almost a feeling of deflation because you know a brilliant game was over the majority of the crowd were dubs they thought they had the game won they didn't win it they just didn't know what to think. They, they, there was thousands of dubs in the ground afterwards. They didn't just leave straight away. I think they were just shell shocked standing around. I, I think maybe the Cork fans might have been able to believe they won it as well because they were they were on the back foot for so long in the game. It was a very odd atmosphere after after seeing a team win an All Ireland semi final. All right. Cork were back in an All Ireland final, and this time down the team who had knocked out Kerry provided the opposition. A lot of people had maybe tipped Kildare to beat down, and but you know down. You know I think they were. They were the better team in the day and you know, they came into the final with a uh, very good pedigree and an awful lot of, an awful lot of uh, wind in their sails.
Remember the tall lad you went to college with? The lad who ate all the mini pizzas. You went out with your one with the hair, remember? The hair? Remember, boom fluff face, always in the double denim. He was always winking. Remember, he had the big hairy, winky head in him, and he always said, Well, well. What was his name? Was it Brian? Brian McSomething or other? Or I think this isn't a good time right now. Well, not a great time. What's wrong with me here? It's grand. It was it Dean? Dwayne. Dwayne? It was awful weird, anyway. What goes through a sheep's head when they're watching football games? Call the UK for an incredible 10 cent a minute with Meteor. 100 Irish Hits, the fantastic new five CD collection. All your favourites, including Joe Dolan, Mary Black, Sonny Knowles, Dolores Keane and Johnny McAvoy. 100 Irish Hits, the sensational new five CD collection with the greatest hits from the Furies, Louise Morrissey, Brendan Boyer, Red Hurley and here's Dickie. Baby, I'm young. Classics from Liam Clancy, Francis Black, and a little bit of country from Mick Flavin. 100 Irish hits, the greatest collection ever. Yes, there's more. Where the strawberry beds. 100 Irish Hits, your complete five CD collection. Out now from Dolphin. Breast milk is perfect for your baby. Nothing compares to it. One of its many benefits is that it feeds the friendly bacteria in your baby's tummy. How time flies by. If you decide to move on from breastfeeding, choose Aptimil Follow On Milk to help support your baby from the inside, so he's ready to take on life on the outside. Aptimil Follow-On, winner of Maternity and Infant Baby Food 2010. Josh Groban, Illuminations, includes his own amazing version of Galileo. Who puts the rainbow in the sky? Josh Groban and his stunning new album, Illuminations. Also includes the single Hidden Away. Hidden Away. Josh Groban, Illuminations. Out now at Tesco. The most music in the morning this is Spin 1038. This is fully charged with Ryan and Tracy. Don't leave us. General gave his army. <laughs> Obviously. Fully <laughs> <laughs> charged with Ryan and Tracy. Spin 1038. Deadly Buzz. Cork had started the 2010 Championship as one of the favourites to win Sam Maguire. However, they tasted defeat early in the Munster Championship against Kerry and at times in the qualifiers they had struggled to find their best form. However, that hadn't stopped them progressing to an All-Ireland final, where Down provided the opposition. Down were my tip for the Ulster title this year and I didn't think they'd, they'd win anything else. I thought that would be kind of a good stepping stone for, for James McCartan in his first year as manager. Um, after they lost to Tyrone, a terrible second half performance. I don't think many people, myself included, thought they were going anywhere, but they got the rehabilitation through the qualifiers. I don't think it was until the, the Sligo game when people started to take notice when they scored 320 and then people were saying Sligo had a six day turnaround. They got to Croke Park, they preserved their 100% unbeaten record in Championship football against Kerry 5 for 5. That semi final against Galair wasn't without controversy. The Benny Kilder goal, which obviously was a square ball. Alan Smith kicked the point early on for Galair, which was wave wide. And then we had the last couple of minutes, Robert Kelly's uh, shot that was tipped on to Barbara Calum King. But down were doing enough to get to an all-around final and I suppose they deserve to be there. A couple of extra games probably didn't do them any harm. They, they reshuffled a couple of players, you know, they brought Kevin McCarnan out to say the back. It was a revelation there and nearly unstoppable there. So, you know, they probably found their best 15 in, in the in the best places on the, on the pitch for them. And, you know, they came into the game with an awful lot of momentum, had a, had a very good win. And, um, 
over Kildare in the in the semi final, and you know a lot of people maybe tip Kildare to beat down and but you know down you know I think they were they were the better team in the day and you know they came into the final with a uh, very good pedigree and not a lot of not a lot of uh, win their sales. In many ways, it would have they would have been a dream All Ireland winner this year this year. Fifty years since the 1960 victory, that was the first win for a team from the six counties, um, and they don't make a habit of losing finals. They've no. never done it. Statistics to me are, are there to be. Or records are there to be torn up and broken and uh, I think that's the approach you have to have um, you know if we were to leave that get to our heads you know we wouldn't turn out at all from a down point of view this idea that the, the legacies that have gone before them and the fact that they've won every all earned final that they played in could have weighed heavily on their shoulders or they could have drawn comfort from it for, for me looking in I don't buy into legacies and, and any of this stuff um, I think that the, the game is going to be won and lost on the pitch by the players it's probably won and lost in the mind and it's probably won and lost on a training pitch over the three or four weeks leading into an all earning final There's no doubt about uh, that tradition is a very important part of Gaelic games and you know Down's tradition stands them they come to Crow Park and they expect to win teams don't like playing them they've never lost to Kerry they're the only team that can say that practically they've never lost to Kerry in championship football they have a tremendous record at Crow Park. They've never lost an All-Ireland final before this year. They, when they pull on that jersey, the down players just, they, they play with a certain confidence uh, and that comes from the tradition they have. It was all set up for an intriguing battle. Although the two teams would have to start without their captains because of injury. Ambrose Rogers played no part for down, while Graham Canty on the bench for the Rebels. Since I first hurt my leg there in the Roscommon game, I think between that and All Ireland final, I've done maybe, um, maybe two or three, anyway, or 60% training sessions. So I had no whole lot done, and we played in a, a 15 against 15 the week before the Saturday before, seven, eight days before the final, and I wasn't able to take part in that. I took part in, you know, none of that. So you knew within that that definitely you weren't going to be, you weren't going to be a prospect to start, and you know your even chances of being involved were. Were, um, were dwindling every every minute, so um, you knew you knew seven or eight days before that you wouldn't be starting the game. So this is it. History beckons for one team, disappointment for the other. Can Down retain their perfect record in All Ireland finals, or will Cork finally win back Sam Maguire after 20 long barren years? You have to look at it in both, for looking at it from both camps. Down have had a great year regardless. For Cork, if they had lost that All Ireland final, 2010 was a total and utter unmitigated disaster. Initially, at the start of this game, I think Cork, Cork exploded out of the traps. They could have had one two on the board before Down even felt the weight of the ball in their forwards. And um, I think Alan O'Connor had an early chance. He put a wide. Kieran Sheen. Um, straight down through the middle, ran through the middle, and Brendan McVeigh pulled off a great save. Um, but then Cork lost their way a little bit. One stage in, in the first half, we were down seven points to two, and you know after starting reasonably well, you know we, we did decent first ten minutes, created a lot of opportunities, but but didn't take them, and sometimes that can be very disheartening for a team. But but if you do create the chances and you take, you know, well under fifty percent of them, you know it's it's um it's it's hard thing mentally maybe to maybe to you know put it aside and try and you know focus on the next ball. Just before half time, we probably got a point or two back, which brought it back to three points. It was manageable then again. And, you know, even in that first half, you know, we had shown glimpses of potential there where we were capable of opening them up. Uh, Graham Canty, uh, Cork's captain, and he's kind of the heartbeat of the team as well. He pulled a hamstring, uh, scoring a point against us, in the All Ireland quarter final. He started against Dublin in the semi final, uh, clearly wasn't fit, was taken off. Uh, he was started on the bench uh, in the, the All Ireland final. Uh, Conor Coonan chose not to bring him on at half time when you know a lot of other managers would have brought him on maybe 42 minutes uh, of the game gone and it was a huge boost for Cork then because the crowd they saw Graham Canty coming on the crowd really got behind the team it was a big lift um, I, I, I don't know if it was planned or it was you know, maybe a complete accident I'm not sure if Conor would have to answer that you know at the time I wasn't really aware you know you were just kind of focusing on you know that, that you're going to be brought on maybe five or six minutes into the second half Conor said at half time that You'd be introduced there in five or ten minutes. He said, you know, start warming up. So you were just kind of focusing on yourself and what you try and do when you get on the pitch. We probably felt we'd get a bit more added value, you know, if you know, if we could get a run in these things, and you know, having the added bonus then of 
Graham coming in, the crowd getting behind you and giving you the lift. Yeah, look, it was a factor and it was something we gave a bit of thought to, all right. There were some men for uh, getting the crowd going as well, whipping up to a frenzy after Patrick Connery before. One of the, the, the all-time yeah. greats. I mean, he's, he's obviously taken a leaf out of the Milan Shanahan playbook. Uh, and he's really run for, run with it. What, what did you actually say to Daniel Goulding when he was kicking that last free? <laughs> or is it repeatable? <laughs> we'll, we'll hold on that one, we'll skip on that. So we will. I don't think he helped me, or that's his excuse anyway. <laughs> I've said once or twice to Daniel since the, since the final arrived, but uh, I think to be fair to Daniel, he was told it was the last kick of the game, so he said, sure, you know, I might as well go for it. The final whistle went. What, what was, how did you feel on the sideline at that stage? Actually, listen, it was just great relief, you know, for all the hard work for everyone and I suppose more especially the players and particularly those players who had been there in years previous you know and hadn't got uh, the right result it was great just to see you know the sheer enjoyment in their faces. I'm honoured and delighted to accept this cup on behalf of this fine bunch of players. We suffered disappointment, heartache and a few more things along the last couple of years but we showed true character and fair play to them to come back and try and win it here again today. An estimated 50,000 people turned up in Cork City Centre this evening to welcome home the Cork football team. Captain Graeme Canty and his team paraded the Sam Maguire Trophy to the thousands gathered. It's Cork's seventh All-Ireland senior football title and the first since 1990. Probably, you know, think of it, you know, dream of over the last couple of years. See, could, see, could you actually get there? And I suppose when the whistle went, was it there was a realisation that you had, you had finally got over the line? Even in the follow-up to the weeks after, you know, the sheer joy that it had brought, you know, I suppose having been involved 20 years ago, it certainly didn't seem as significant, but certainly people at the times we live in now, but they certainly seem to get great enjoyment out of it. For 20 years, Cork suffered heartache when it came to All-Ireland Finals. Now that they have their hands on Sam Maguire, the big question is, can they hold on to him in 2011? Through this Tuesday night, as we have another gripping investigation from Louis Thoreau. He's in Sin City. We're gambling with him in Las Vegas in a few moments' time.